go ahead and get started because time is always of the essence. So welcome again to everyone. Um, as many of you know who have attended our Lunch and Learns in the past, I do have some logistics I want to go through and then I will welcome our guest speaker for today. So um, again, you are muted and we are going to ask that you stay muted and that's really just to reduce distractions, especially for the recording. Um, Tom may use some polls and ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, and our chat box, as you know, is our primary mode of communication to, you know, to ask your own questions, to answer questions, and we'll be possibly providing some links in there as well. So if you haven't already, go ahead, open up the chat box now. And of course, know that your name does appear when you use the everybody function. If you want to have a private chat, you can do that in private mode. And while Tom is presenting, I will field any non-substantive questions and we'll park all the substantive questions for the end of the session. We have a, we'll have a Q&A period at the end. And of course, if anyone has a specific situation they would like to discuss or is not comfortable using the chat box, you can contact the Ombuds office to schedule a separate consultation. We do aim to keep these presentations at about 30 minutes, and this provides you with that bite-sized amount of information, and then we'll get you back to your day. And as I've already mentioned a couple of times, we are recording this session, and we do that in an effort you know, to reach as many people as possible, including those who are unable to attend today. Later today, um, at some point, I will send a follow-up email with links um, to the feedback survey, any references that Tom provides, and information about future programs. All right, so let me go ahead. I am very pleased to introduce today's guest speaker, Tom Kosakowski. Tom became the first ombuds for the Health Sciences Campus at the University of Southern California in January of 2019. And in this role, Tom works with faculty, staff, administrators, trainees, and students affiliated with five teaching hospitals, schools of medicine and pharmacy, research laboratories, and off-campus clinics. For the prior 12 years, Tom was the ombudsperson at the UCLA Health System. He also established the ombuds office at Claremont Graduate University and was the interim campus ombuds at UC Riverside. He served on the board of directors of the International Ombudsman Association, including a stint as president, and frequently teaches and mentors new ombuds. Since 2006, Tom has published the ombuds blog and is a reviewer for the Journal of the International Ombudsman Association. Before becoming an ombuds, Tom worked as an attorney and served as a court appointed mediator of the Los Angeles Superior Court. Tom graduated from Occidental College and earned his JD from Loyola Law School. So welcome Tom, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Liz. Um, I'm just very happy to be invited uh, to speak to this group today. At uh, USC, we have been doing Lunch and Learns as well since April, and I hold the, the CU Ombuds Office in very high regard. Um, over the past uh, few decades, it's been a notable program in the history of, of Ombuds in higher ed, and I also hold um, Kiersey and Liz in very high regard. Um, if, you, if you have just been coming to these programs, you you may not know that Kiersey was a leader when she was working in the University of California system. And I think she's a thought leader on anti-bullying efforts in higher ed. Um, Liz has also um, been exemplary in leadership positions that she's held within the International Ombudsman Association and the American Bar Association, all to promote the work of organizational ombuds. Um, so I was really happy to, to come to this and, and and meet this group and, and share one of my recent talks that I gave to USC. I'll start by saying that the, the goal of ombuds trainings is pretty simple. Uh, we want to get people to come more, become more mindful about conflict. And emerging research is confirming this. It's, it's showing that when people use wise reasoning about an interpersonal conflict, they are more happy with the outcomes. And so getting people to be mindful about conflict motivates a wide range of the work that ombuds do. We are always telling people conflict is normal. We are always listening to people who are involved in a conflict and, and struggling to manage it. We are always coaching people to think about conflict re resolution strategies. And we are often giving trainings that offer different frames for thinking about conflict. And this is just one more example 
um, along with the, the programs that you've heard here, the lunch and learns that um, Liz and Kiersey and others in your office, your office have been providing uh, over the past many months. <clears throat> so um, let me start <clears throat> by talking about what cognitive biases are. Uh, defining uh, my topic for the day, um, cognitive biases uh, result from our brain's attempt to simplify information. Um, we evolved, our brains evolved in simpler times over the last millennia, and modern society by comparison often overwhelms our brains. So these cognitive biases often work as sort of mental rules of thumb that help us make sense of the world and reach decisions uh, more easily, more quickly. Um, so the, in, in theory, some of these biases gave us humans an evolutionary advantage. So one type of cognitive bias describes uh, the ability to perceive patterns and correlations. And this may have given early humans an advantage in avoiding predators, um, finding food, or um, avoiding life-threatening situations. Uh, some biases are related to memory uh, the way you remember an event may be biased for a number of reasons, and that in turn can lead to biased thinking and it affects decision making. Um, other cognitive biases may be related to problems with attention. Since attention is a limited resource, people have to be selective about what they pay, pay attention to in the world around them. So there's a lot of evolving uh, research and science about cognitive biases. And a lot of it is just theoretical at this point. Uh, Wikipedia lists nearly 150 types of biases. Um, one of my favorites is uh, the IKEA effect. This is a cognitive bias in which consumers place a disproportionately high value on things that they have partially created. Um, the name of course refers to the Swedish manufacturer um, that sells stuff that we make. Um, uh, to, a 2011 study found that subjects were willing to pay 63% more for furniture they had assembled themselves compared to equivalent pre-assembled items. So it's a, real, it's a real value for companies like Ikea. And it also explains why our kids won't throw out things they made at a Build-A-Bear store. Uh, the Ikea effect is the basis for pay-to-paint pay to paint pottery stores like Color Me Mine and pick your own orchards where the fruit is no cheaper. Um, we value this sort of hands-on experience. I, I can't tie it back to an evolutionary um, uh, rationale, um, but this is a, a, an emerging cognitive bias that people are starting to study. And retailers and other uh, people that seek to influence our thinking um, are well aware of these cognitive biases uh, like IKEA. So there are several ways to group and categorize cognitive biases. Some of them, um, some of the biases uh, relate to our facility with numbers, others with information processing. Some biases are reflected in our personal belief systems and can be categorized on that basis. Many biases affect our memories and others relate, how we, relate to how we interact with people. Um, and of course, because these, bi these biases um, affect our thinking and judgment and reasoning, they perceive how we, um, they affect how we perceive conflict and how we respond to conflict. In our work as odds, um, we see several ways that cognitive bias affects people trying to resolve conflict. And I think, um, for me, my work as an ombuds also reflects my prior work as an attorney, as a mediator, as a parent, um, which are all jobs that involve helping people navigate through conflict. Um, so this is just sort of a continuation of that as an ombuds. And I, so I do see on a day-to-day -day basis how these different types of cognitive biases can impact people that are sort of navigating through conflicts. And so for today, I wanted to talk about just five, not 100 plus cognitive biases that, that I see in the ombuds office. And my best guess is that, uh, that your ombuds office sees these as well. Um, I chose these five, but I did not include the most common bias that leads to conflict. Um, if I were to have a poll here, I would probably be throwing out a question 
you know, what is the most common bias that leads to conflict? Um, and the answer is, is stereotyping. As we all know, bias uh, on the basis of gender, race, ethnicity, and other protected characteristics is not only illegal, but one of the primary problems facing our society and our organizations and our personal relationships. Um, it's a topic that deserves more time than I have today. Uh, fortunately, it's getting attention in other forums. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that that significant um, bias of stereotyping is the most important bias that, that relates to conflict. But I'm, I'm gonna skip over it today. So let's talk about these five different biases. And I'll start with anchoring bias. We're all familiar with anchoring bias. Um, the common example that's cited if you read about this is, um, is found at department store jewelry counters. And we've all seen this, the signs that say that the items have been significantly marked down and the, the signs usually show the original much higher price. And that's designed to anchor a buyer's value of an item. <clears throat> um, I had another example that happened um, in my neighborhood about a decade ago. Um, there was a parcel of, of land that was basically the parking lot of a historic a department store that was bought by a developer and the initial plans that were announced to the, the neighborhood were to put in a multiplex, a large grocery store, a dozen or so retail outlets and uh, apartments. And the neighborhood you know, responded with an uproar about this huge development that was gonna bring in lots of traffic. And um, they then kind of forced the developer to have town hall meetings and strategy sessions. And they eventually negotiated a much smaller footprint for this development, um, fewer stores, a smaller size. And uh, with the community's blessing, the developer went ahead and built this, built this project. Well, uh, records came out a couple of years later, turns out that the developer really had just paid for an artist rendering of this huge project, uh, had never pulled permits for it, had never planned or put it out to bid for that size, had always intended to build the development that they ended up with. And what they had done was anchor the community's um, perspective on that initial plan that made it much easier for them to um, end up in the place that they did. So I thought that was pretty crafty and people were kind of mad about it afterwards, but it had been done. Um, so um, as ombuds, we see anchoring at play in our work. Um, so when the university negotiates salaries, especially with new hires, um, when people are trying to um, mediate a conflict, we'll see anchoring affect those, those conversations. So what do we do if we see um, anchoring? Um, how do we respond? And the first step is acknowledgement. Um, the first step to avoiding this bias is to admit that it exists. Um, if you've come this far and you now see, it, see the bias, um, that's, that's the most important uh, step. It's the first step. We need to acknowledge that our minds are susceptible to this influence and then we're less likely to fall into the trap that's being set by the person that's trying to anchor us. Then we need to step back and take our time. Unless it's absolutely necessary, it's important for us to think about our decisions, um, to acknowledge the anchoring bias and look at the bigger picture. And then we respond by diffusing the anger clearly and forcefully, like saying, I'm not trying to play games with you, but we are miles apart on this item. If you don't diffuse this anchor first, you're, you're essentially implying or admitting that the anchor is within the bargaining zone. Um, so you need to do that. You need to quickly acknowledge that, that there is this anchor that you're not going to deal with. And after you do that, after you diffuse the anchor, then you move to your counter proposal. Um, and many people will often, um, uh, avoid repeating the anchor so that they don't give it any more validity. Um, and when you make your counter offer, you want to explain why it's fair and justifiable. And an effective strategy is to be patient and persistent while working towards the value that you perceive as fair, not to become emotional when you feel like you have been anchored. Um, another um, bias that I, I want to point out is the sunk cost fallacy. 
And this is the general tendency for people to continue an endeavor or continue consuming or pursuing an option um, if they've invested significant effort or other resources. Um, the effect becomes a fallacy if it's pushing you to do things that are making you unhappy or worse off than if you were to give up. The classic example of, of the sunk cost fallacy is a gambler who continues to bet even when they're down. Um, so you hear people say, well, I need to double my bet here if I'm going to uh, get out of this hole that I'm in. And we also see the sunk cost fallacy in a wide variety of, of university settings. Um, a, a fairly common example is a postdoc who's had a fairly successful couple of years in a the lab. They've published or co-authored several articles, but they're now unhappy with perhaps the PI or some other aspect of the research. And the postdoc will come in to talk to the ombuds about whether or not to leave. And they will say, yeah, I wanna go, but I still have two papers that are in progress. One of them's pretty close to being published. And so I feel like maybe I should wait until there's a better time. The reality is that, that there's always one or more papers in progress that they've worked on. There's really never gonna be a better time. Um, and they're having a hard time making a decision and moving on because of this sunk cost fallacy. So we'll help people try to overcome this. Um, and the first step, again, is to acknowledge the bias and recognize what the sunk costs have been. Um, a few months ago, I happened to explain this, this cognitive bias to my sister. And then a few days later, she was waiting in the doctor's office um, for what turned out to be a ridiculously long period of time. And um, when her husband said, well, we waited this long, we might as well wait a bit longer. My sister immediately recognized this as, a, as sunk cost thinking. And so once you realize this is an important cognitive bias, you'll start seeing it probably in your day-to-day -day life. So once you're aware of it, um, you need to ask yourself, would I make the same decision if there were no sunk costs or fewer sunk costs? And this is one of my favorite methods for countering the influence of sunk costs. You know, if you're the postdoc, take away the consideration of whether or not you're gonna get those two papers published as you are right now, unhappy in the lab, should you stay or should you go? Um, try to ignore how much effort and time you have um, already invested. I think it also helps to conduct a thought experiment with the situation. So mentally go back to the start of the effort and imagine that you now know, um, or that you knew then what you now know, and what would you tell your future self? Um, if you, if you knew that your boyfriend or girlfriend would treat you so badly, would you tell your future self to stick with it? Um, if you knew that your project was gonna run $50,000 over budget and still not produce clear results after two years, would you tell your future self to keep more pouring money into it? If you knew that you would be unhappy two years into your PhD, would you tell yourself to change directions? So that's a helpful way of, of moving past this sunk cost um, bias, which will lead us to do things that we probably shouldn't continue to do. A third bias that we see is the framing effect. And this is a bias that impacts decision-making um, when the problem is expressed in different ways. Um, the framing effect has been consistently shown to be one of the largest biases in decision-making. And, and for that reason, it's one of the biases that's been researched the most. A good example is playing out right now with the COVID vaccine. So research on vaccines has shown that people have very different responses when the efficacy of a vaccine is explained in positive or negative terms. For example, more people will, will take a vaccine that saves lives 95% of the time. Um, but you'll have a fewer, you have a lower adoption rate, a lower vaccination rate, if the vaccine is being advertised as having a failure rate of one in 20. So just the way um, the success rate is being framed um, has a huge impact on um, acceptance on a, on a broad scale. Um, researchers are finding that, that framing effects increase with age. Um, and, and as we know, age differences are very important when considering healthcare and financial decisions. Um, interestingly, the framing effect seems to disappear when encountering it in a second language. So people that are speaking English um, as their second language think more objectively about things and, and they're less influenced by the positive or negative frame. 
in our work as ombuds, we're always presenting people with options to resolve their conflicts. And it's important for us to talk to people about how their options are framed and to help them think about uh, different frames that, that might enable them to make um, a more informed and more rational decision. So reframing is, is what we do. <laughs> it's a very common strategy for ombuds and for mediators, but it's also used by psychologists, life coaches, political speech writers, pollsters, um, uh, public health officials. The first step is to recognize that the problem has been framed in a particular way. And the easiest way is to, uh, to, to recognize the frame is to look for alternate ways of framing. Um, talking with another person who probably doesn't think like you or doesn't um, share your same goals will probably be uh, a good resource if you're trying to brainstorm alternative perspectives on an issue and try to understand uh, a different frame. A second strategy is to identify the various relevant interests um, that are being presented by the frame. Oftentimes issues in conflicts are framed by people's different positions. Um, and I'm gonna draw a distinction here between positions and interests. Um, and this is something that, that an ombuds can help people do is, is recognize when there's a difference between someone's position and their underlying interest. So for example, an employee may say, I don't wanna work past 4 p.m. That's their position. And their supervisor might say, you have to work late so we can get the new students registered for class. That's their position. Um, this conflict now is being framed by those two positions, but it's important to recognize that the positions have underlying interests. The employee may be concerned about setting a precedent. They don't wanna work late in the future, or they may wanna get home to care for their children. On the other hand, the supervisor's interest may not be reflected by their position. The supervisor may think that the employee is the only one qualified to register the students. Um, and, and that's a huge priority for the department. So if those two parties can talk about their interests, they may be able to move past the initial frame of the conflict. Uh, a third technique for, um, for, for reframing when there's a value conflict is avoidance. Um, and we do see this where the parties uh, presented with a conflict are sort of at an impasse and they agree to disagree on certain points. They're unable to change the frame or develop a new frame together, um, but they just simply decide, well, we can't agree on this point, we're gonna move beyond it. I think overall, it's important to acknowledge that framing is a very fact specific um, exercise. Um, it's hard to give lots of generalizations about um, how reframing works because it really depends on the circumstances of the, of the conflict and the frame being used. And it always helps to have a knowledgeable, patient and neutral person to help you with reframing. There are probably several people that, that might be able to do this for you. And I wanna encourage you to think that um, the ombuds should be first on your list. If you have a problem where you feel like the frame might be in inhibiting your ability to work toward a resolution. Uh, my fourth bias, attribution error, is a very common cognitive bias that we hear in the ombuds office. Simply put, um, people judge others by their, by their personality and they judge themselves by the situation. Um, my example comes from Los Angeles where <laughs> I used to commute <laughs> um, and I see this attribution error on the freeway. The, the, person, the person ahead of me who's driving too slowly um, is an idiot. Um, I'm just driving with the flow of traffic. Um, but if I'm driving with the flow of traffic and there's someone who's tailgating me, they, they're an a-hole. Um, <laughs> so I always judge myself um, uh, in a positive light and I judge others in a negative light. <clears throat> and this is this fundamental attribution error happens all the time. And we see it in our work in higher ed. Um, we will often hear from employees who feel like their boss is picking on them and wants to fire them. And the employee rarely offers insights as to why their boss might be doing or saying what they, what they are doing. Um, and this is attribution error playing out in real life. So, so what do we do when people are, <clears throat> um, seem to have mistaken attributions? How do we help them overcome that? Um, 
one of the best antidotes is empathy. It's easy to blame other people's conduct on some apparent permanent fixture of their personality, um, especially when we view that behavior negatively. But it's hard to keep feeling that way once you imagine how you'd feel in their position. Um, yeah, this isn't going to work for the other bad drivers on my freeway. <laughs> but if it's someone that you have an ongoing relationship with, uh, developing empathy is vital and the key to working toward a resolution with them. So the steps for overcoming attribution error with, with empathy. Number one, identifying the subjective negative judgments you have made about the other person. Secondly, <clears throat> you think about the person's behavior that came before your negative opinion. And third, you wanna think about alternative neutral or even positive reasons for that person's actions. The goal here is to gain an understanding of their actions and motivations. Um, and it can be hard to do this on your own because you're sort of guessing. Um, but talking to a neutral party is an effective way to help you through this sort of brainstorming um, and brainstorming empathy. <clears throat> Another approach that Abbots will often advise is to, is to coach that person to ask the other person in the conflict in a friendly and open way to explain their actions. So we will, we will do it ourselves. We will also encourage our visitors um, who are in a conflict where there's attribution error at play. Think about going to your boss um, and saying, hey, yesterday this happened. Can you tell me more about why? Um, what was your goal? Um, what were you hoping to achieve? Um, this is disarming um, and, and can be super effective in, <clears throat> in helping people overcome this attribution error, just getting more information so they can understand the other's perspective. <clears throat> Um, finally, <clears throat> um, I'll talk about the zero sum bias. And this is a, a false belief that when people interact, one person can only benefit or gain if another person loses. Um, uh, neuroscientists um, and evolutionary neurologists believe that zero sum thinking was an evolutionary adaptation to the time where we lived in small bands of hunter gatherers. Um, in those times, resources like food, um, mates, uh, and other resources were, were finite and often scarce. So more for one person um, by default meant less for another. However, today's are, today things are obviously different, um, but we still have a tendency to think um, in zero-sum terms. Um, and when when we do that, when we think about things in the zero-sum zero -sum terms, <clears throat> we're more likely to be competitive, less likely to be cooperative because we see people as, as a threat, um, an existential threat. So for example, when students think that they're being graded on a curve, um, a grading scheme that makes the allocation of grades zero sum, uh, they're less likely to provide assistance to their classmates um, because a classmate's gain could be their loss. Um, that's a rare example. I think the reality is um, in higher ed, the, the conflicts we see on a campus are almost never zero sum. There's almost always some way of working toward a resolution where um, not everyone either wins or loses uh, proportionately. Um, <clears throat> part of the reason why conflict um, makes us think about, uh, zero, makes us think in zero sum terms is, as I said, this, this, this survival instinct that conflict can, can sort of trigger. Um, this, when we have the zero sum thinking, we're often focusing on short term um, gains and losses, uh, but that's counterproductive um, because we need to cooperate with other people. <laughs> um, our success as a student, as a faculty member, as a staff member on a university um, really is intrinsically linked with the success of um, our work group, our lab, our class, um, whatever project we're working on. So an effective strategy for countering a zero sum bias is to talk to someone outside the conflict who can help you be calm and assess the situation and explore outcomes that you may not have thought of that are collaborative and positive. And once again, this is an ideal role for your ombuds who 
understand campus situations and can offer neutral insights and maybe even draw on their institutional um, knowledge with other examples of non-zero sum resolutions. Uh, I'll conclude with some general guidelines. Um, first of all, we can all benefit from knowing more about cognitive biases. And I'll put some resources in the, in the chat that are actually pretty interesting and easy reading. Um, and knowing more about these biases will pay off. Um, in a study fairly recently, researchers gave feedback and information to help the study participants understand biases and how they influence decisions. And the results of the study found that this type of cognitive bias training can reduce um, the effects of the bias by about a third. So once we recognize our biases, then we can begin to be more deliberate about challenging them ourselves or getting help from others to challenge them. So if you meet with an ombuds, uh, they will help you consider the influences on your decisions that will lead to better choices during a conflict. And ombuds will be gentle and will ask you questions like, what are some of the factors that you've missed? Are you giving too much weight to these factors or considerations? Are you ignoring relevant information because it doesn't support your view? Uh, they'll engage in that sort of conversation that will help expand um, you past these cognitive biases and, uh, and lead to better decisions. Okay, so I've dropped some um, the further reading into the chat and I'm not sure how we're doing on time, so. So yes, Tom, let me, let me chime in. This is Liz. Thank you so much. Liz, that was thanks. great and very informative. Um, yeah, we're at 1231. So I know some people are telling me privately they need to hop off. Um, but for fine. those of you who want to stick around, Tom, can you hang around for a few minutes? Because there was at least one question that I've seen so far in the chat. I will stay as long as anybody wants. Okay, <laughs> great. So for those of you who need to leave, thanks so much for joining. And of course, um, we'll continue recording. So you can always check the recording later. I'll include that link uh, in the follow up email. So the question, Tom, that came in was, how much does race and gender layer into these five biases on a regular basis? And they give a little bit of a, some context and example. Yeah. So they say, for instance, you know, it may be tough for a person of color or a woman to find another lab or another job or develop a new frame to negotiate from a place of power um, or to be in a space where they have the authority that they feel they need to speak up. So any thoughts on that? Wow, that's that's a great question. And I think it highlights the fact that um, these biases that, that are reflected in privileges um, are so important. Um, I think a lot of it really depends on the situation, um, whether you know the person that you're going to be interacting with or not, whether you are a complete stranger or not. Um, you know, um, and there are probably a variety of tactics and I don't know which is the most ethical um, or the which is most comfortable for a person in an individual case. Um, you know, I know, I know situations where the person with less power is using code switching to um, make them say, seem more appealing, less of a threat. Um, I know people that will do research on the person that they're going to be interacting with and finding out what their, you know, to develop a best guess about what their underlying um, interests are so that they can appeal to those when they, when they start the negotiation. Um, yeah, I think it's very fact specific. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm interested in, in hearing what you think about this as well is. No, I think that's right. I think, yeah, or any, yeah, Kirzi, anyone else that has some thoughts, I can, I can unmute you if you let me know in the chat that you want to speak. Um, but yeah, I would agree with what you're saying, Tom. I think, you know, so many of these situations, it's not a one size fits all, right? You're going to have to use judgment and discernment, consider not only the people involved, but the relationship. What, and then you said it earlier, you know, what, what's your goal? What are you trying to achieve um, in, in trying to really, um, flesh out, you know, how to approach or how to um, resolve biases or anything for that matter. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, it's tricky. I don't know that there's a one size 
answer for this. Anyone else? Um, I don't see anyone else in chat letting me know they want to chime in on that, but we're I'm looking. So if you want to weigh in on that, let me know and I can unmute you. This is Kiersey. I just um, I want to say that, you know, this question is like the $4 million question. Mm -hmm. um, and I have personally been looking for research-based answers to this question for at least 20 years. Um, and what I can share is that I have not found a really great answer yet. Uh, and I like research-based answers because I, I always worry that some great solution is based on a you know, an individual's charisma, for example. Um, and when I, you know, I even attended a, a Harvard negotiation uh, course um, and, you know, posed this to the instructors from the Harvard Business School and they did not have a good answer. Um, so, you know, from my perspective, we need more people of color to be doing research on these issues. Um, I just, I haven't come up with a satisfactory uh, blanket answer. Um, and, and I keep looking, basically. There's a new book coming out soon about how to change your mind um, and, and um, blanking on the name of the author. Um, and I'm wondering if that can apply to Adam Grant. He's a psychologist at the Wharton School. I'm wondering if that can apply to this issue. So I am constantly seeking answers that I haven't found a great one. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Kirzi. I think for Sorry people that to, are in those yeah. situations where they're, when they're aware that there's some bias um, at work against them, um, the ombuds will give them a safe place to talk through the situation and then identify the different sort of options they have and even the strategies they may have. So I mean, if we can expand um, you know, the, the resources and the options that they have to consider, even, even things like the timing of when they might decide to do something and then equip them with skills to pursue those things more effectively, you know, that, that's I think how ombuds can be helpful for those individuals. And then on an institutional level to give feedback if we do see trends of bias that are um, impacting the organization. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. So I do want to um, keep going because we do have another question in the chat here. Uh, if you, re if you, I think what they meant to say is, um, if you recognize bias and are trying to na navigate it, so as a neutral party, how do you handle it when parties um, become defensive or are not open to resolution? Uh, you know, my, my basic strategy, which, which works with a fair amount of these biases, I think, in, in, a, in a range of different conflicts, is to switch to a questioning mode, um, mm -hmm. where if you see someone start to shut down, or you see them stiffen their um, position, um, asking them, you know, so did something change? Mm -hmm. um, it seems like you were a little bit flexible, but now you're not. I mean, why, why was that? Um, can you tell me more about um, your position? Um, even even probing questions about options as they would be open to. You know, what's the least change that you'd be comfortable with? Um, those sort of sort of neutral questions that sort of get them to define their position better and and start to give hints about their underlying interests are probably the most effective way of understanding where they are may give you some clues about the bias that they're, that they're um, being affected by. Uh, and then you may have, you may be able to respond more effectively and work with working with them. Um, mm -hmm. Slowing down the conversation at that point probably will be really helpful. Um, giving yourself a chance to be more strategic, giving them a chance to maybe think about how things have developed, um, giving both of you the chance to, to talk to your support system um, will we'll sometimes help too. Mm, those are, yeah, those are, that's some good tips. Those are some good tips, some good insight. Yeah. Thank you. Asking questions and being patient, I guess. Yes, <laughs> curious, yeah. getting curious, yeah. right? Getting out of that um, judgment mode and trying to get more curious. That's always helpful. 
Um, there was a, I'm not sure if this is a comment or a question, and I, I think, okay, this person's still on the line, so if I got this wrong, let me know. Um, but there was a comment that the help, you know, it was very helpful to hear examples, you know, that, um, that folks can relate to. But there seems to be a, still a, a remaining question of how to improve recognizing the bias. So how do you, are, are there any tips you might offer on how to know when, you know, when, when, it, when it's happening, when, it, when it's creeping in? Um, for me, reading that <laughs> was, the, was the most uh, enjoyable thing. Um, the last item I had in the, on the resource list, um, visual capitalist, 50 cognitive biases. It's sort of a, a poster size um, a summary of cognitive biases. And that, that's really fun to read. Um, and then the Atlantic article um, is, is, you know, the classic Atlantic article with lots more detail than you ever knew existed um, for a weekend long read if, you, if, you're, if you're inclined. I think those sort of things will help you um, start to see them in everyday life. Um, it's sometimes harder to recognize them in conflict when you're in a conflict, but it's easy to see them in marketing and political statements. Um, so you can sort of make it a little bit of a game. That sounds good. So it sounds like some of those resources we're providing or that I'm going to send out later that you provided um, may have some helpful guidance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, just looking through. Um, <laughs> there was a comment touching on something you said earlier, Tom, about uh, someone's daughter being very upset when they recycled her treasured preschool artwork. <laughs> so people can relate to what you're saying, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Anything else that you want to add or comment on, Tom, before we wrap things up? No, I think I made... Um... I think I made my case for why you should go to the ombuds office. Um, <laughs> I'm, guessing, I'm guessing that the people that come to these lunch and learns uh, do that, but um, um, and, and hopefully I presented a new sort of framework for thinking about things that affect us in conflict. Mm -hmm. No, you have. Thank you so much for that. And you're getting, I don't know if you're seeing the chat, but you're getting some great kudos. So thanks again for joining us. It's always a pleasure. And um, I don't know, did you, I don't know if you want to provide your contact information and people want to reach out to you directly, or if you want me to include that in a follow up, or if you'd rather not, it's up to you. Um, sure, I'd be happy if people want to contact me. Um, and you can give my work email out. Okay. So for those of you still on the line, I will go ahead and include that um, in the follow up email later today or tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. And thanks, Tom. Thank you, everybody. Oh, it looks like Teresa is 